So welcome back to Bookaholics, the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking's podcast series dedicated to books. In this series, we introduce you to some recent and relevant books, our own books, and obviously classical books that we just can't stop thinking and teaching about. My name is Gustav van Houten, and in this episode of Bookaholics, I'm joined by David Neuheiser to talk about his latest book, Hope in Secular Age, Deconstruction in Negative Theology and the Future of Faith, published by Cambridge University Press last year. Hello, David, and welcome back. Thank you. Now, David, as we are used here in Bookaholics, we always let the author give us a short introduction to the book. You wrote it, so who better than you can tell us what it is all about, and above all, what you intended or hoped to achieve in writing this book. The first motivation of the book and where it really began for me is is very personal. So the first line of the book is that I wrote the book because I think it's hard to hope. And that uh, relates to my experience of what it's like to be human. I feel like um, despair is a sort of obvious threat People feel disappointment in uh, in their personal relationships when someone lets them down, in politics when the movement they support doesn't come to fruition, um, in other areas of their life. And it can be hard in this context to keep hope. Sometimes our, our hope isn't strong enough to, to persist in the face of, of disappointment. On the other hand, I also am familiar in my life with the sort of the pull, the, the gravitational force of complacency. I think just as despair is a threat to hope in my experience, feeling too comfortable or feeling like the way things are is how they'll continue is also a threat to hope. And in just the same way, I think it's hopeless just in the other direction from despair. And so as I reflect in my life about how to how to keep hope, I feel like um, some of the some of the ways that philosophers have thought about hope aren't really robust enough to do the hope that I feel like in my own life I need hope to do. So there are philosophical and political critiques of hope. Uh, some people argue that it provides a kind of false comfort. Some people say it's pacifying. And at the same time, in in my sort of home discipline of, of Christian thought and theology, there's an interpretation of hope that, that treats it like a sort of confidence. Some Christians say that Um, Christian hope provides a sort of certainty that's grounded in the promises of God that other people don't have access to. I think these hopes these people are describing are are fragile and they're bitter. Uh, they're brittle, sorry. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things, and they can become bitter for sure, one of the things <laughs> that I, I, I try to do in the hope because I feel like I need it in my life is to, just to describe a hope that's more, that's more robust and resilient that this would allow. The second motivation is to respond um, also for very personal reasons to uh, deep questions that a lot of people have, I think, about the place of religion in a secular age. And some, sometimes these questions are sort of very, very direct. They have been my own questions. How is it possible for a person to keep faith when faith isn't obvious in the way that it might have been at some point in the past? Um, and then on the other hand, in in sort of public life, there are questions about the place of religious traditions and communities in the public sphere. Do religious communities have a role to play or should the public sphere be governed by a sort of neutral rationality that everybody can share? And I feel like these questions are pressing for many of our, our societies. And what I came to realize is that the first set of questions about hope helped me to think about the se second set of questions. So basically what the book does is it it draws on uh, the deconstructive philosophy of Jacques Derrida and the negative theology of this medieval theologian, Dionysius the Areopagite, to develop a conception of hope that then the book puts into motion in order to respond to these questions about um, the place of religious faith in the secular age and the prospects for um, religious communities to contribute to the public life of secular societies. So, mm. uh, thank you. Just maybe quickly for uh, the people who don't know Dionysus, what do you in, what do you understand, or or how could you quickly define his uh, negative theology? Just in 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 a second, maybe. Yeah, sure. So it's a it's a really ancient tradition of Christian thought that originates in an impulse that's in the Hebrew scriptures, a sort of anxiety about the danger of idolatry, 
And Christians take up this idea, and in the first and second centuries, uh, so really second and third centuries, they some theologians brought together this critique of idolatry that's biblical with um, some Platonic ideas about the transcendence of of God and the good. And Dionysius is a uh, is a later theologian, sort of fifth sixth century theologian, um, who. Uh, gives the sort of classic, uh, classic synthesis of this tradition. And he argues that because God is the creator of everything, God is beyond the categories of creaturely thought. And because humans have to sort of draw from the categories that are before them in order to, in order to think at all, it, for Dionysius, God is beyond conception and comprehension by humans. And so for him, his theology is often called negative theology because he says, since God is transcendent in this way, Christians have to negate everything they say about God. Um, but at the same time, and this for me is a key, key thing, he keeps saying all of the traditional things that Christians say about God. So his negative theology consists in holding together this negation that he thinks is required by divine transcendence with the sort of robust affirmation of traditional Christian theology. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And, and we will come back to this. So... Um, if I now can pick your brains a bit and go a little bit more into detail, and uh, I'd like to start with some more technical topics. So to begin with, I'd like to know a bit more about your reasons to combine deconstruction and negative theology. How did you come to this idea? I think first it was partly just a, a, uh, the way the books took me. So I, I had this intuition, I had these questions that I have described. And I thought that these authors, Terry Dow and Dionysius, helped me to think about the questions. Um, and I found that actually a lot had been written about deconstruction and negative theology. So it's been this sort of interface between them has been a site for a, a really uh, a lot of discussion about the relationship between religious faith and secularity, partly because Derrida himself wrote about Dionysius. So mm -hmm. Derrida, Derrida was sort of preoccupied by negative theology even from the time I, I've done some work in the in the archives, and um, even when Derrida was a student before he went to yeah. university, he sort of has this interest in it. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in Derrida and religion, and one of the key sites for thinking about what Derrida is doing with religious traditions is his writings about negative theology, Dionysius in particular. What I've discovered is that I feel like almost all of this literature misunderstands how these traditions actually connect to each other. So... Um, Derrida is often thought to, to, to oppose negative theology or to say, to sort of say decisively that negative theology makes an affirmation that deconstruction can't. So, and this is a criticism that a lot of people repeat about negative theology. They say that Dionysius asserts a kind of certain knowledge of God that Derrida rules out. And I think that's a misreading uh, quite demonstrably of Derrida's writings on negative theology, but also it misunderstands what interests him about negative theology. And so one of the things I do is to try to unpack that conversation. And I argue that actually the thing that connects them isn't really this sort of issue about uh, language and epistemology and sort of what we can know and what we can say, but instead it's ethics. And what draws Derrida, I think, to negative theology is his intuition, which I develop at a lot more length than he does, that uh, negative theology shares this, this uh, ethics that Derrida expresses, a sort of ethics of uncertainty that insists that uncertainty is endemic to human life, but in particular to, to the human encounter uh, with transcendence, however that's understood. Um, but it's an ethics that doesn't sort of insist upon um, the sort of closure of speech. It's not a sort of resigned silence. But in my understanding, it's it's a it's an ethics of persistence, persistent affirmation in the face of uncertainty, and mm. that is how I understand hope, and that's why I think hope is what connects Derrida to Nietzsche's. Mm. And and I would like to add a, a small provocation here, and and I would take it even beyond ethics, and more than a feature in deconstruction or in Derridian philosophy, I very I I sense very much that your book there's some kind of hidden Foucaultian operation uh, going on where it's not just uh, ethics, as you say, connects Derrida and Dionysus, but I think they're somehow playing on, on a very similar uh, epistemological field in, 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 in this understanding of what you just said. Am I going too far here? <laughs> 
Oh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I find this question really fascinating because, as you and I have discussed before, Foucault is very important for the way that I think. But I haven't really been sure how to connect my interest in Foucault with my interest in Derrida. So um, I'm, I'm trying in the, the, the book that I'm writing at the moment, my next book, to do something like that. I didn't know that I did it in this book. Maybe you can tell me, maybe you can say a bit more about how you think. But I just sense that 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 there's this, uh, how they structure uh, Derrida, his, his deconstruction and how Dionysius structures his negative the theology. I think there was a lot more in common than just ethics. I think that it is built in structurally in a very similar way. And I thought that that was rather clear from mm. how I read your book. But also Foucault is important for my work. And so maybe I read too much and, and I want to discover him everywhere and maybe also where he isn't present. Yeah. So I might be going. A bit no, no, no. I, no, I think you're right. And, I, and so I'm realizing this is actually quite clarifying because one of the one of the deep instincts that's, I think, implicit in this book and in all of my work but that I don't really bring out is that I, I sort of think ethics has priority over epistemology. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, epistemological moves, you know, in analytic philosophy and in sort of early modern European philosophy, there's a preoccupation with like what we can know, how we can know um, mm -hmm. questions of what it's justified to believe. I think, uh, I think that these questions are often sort of presented in an abstracted form, but I think they often arise from ethical commitments and, okay. um, and also ethical formation. So I feel like um, I feel like uh, there's a certain vision of the human person that's that's formed by uh, the context in which these questions emerge that has a sort of originary force. And I'm realizing, in, uh, in response to your question, that I think this is an idea that I have taken partly from Foucault because, um, as as Foucault, I mean, I'm especially formed by Foucault's later work, but there mm. sort of turns to ethics in my reading partly because. He realizes that these qu questions of knowledge are inseparable from questions of, of how the self is mm -hmm. formed by yeah. power, but also how the self forms mm -hmm. itself. And so the, the, the story that I've told that I've just sketched about deconstruction and negative theology emphasizes the ethical, because I think mm -hmm. that's the sort of deepest affinity between them. But I do think you're right. You're pushing me to recognize something that I had not explicit <laughs> myself. Which is that I feel like this this sort of ethics that they share does affect the way that they deal with questions of knowledge, the way that they think about things. Yeah, for sure. yeah. yeah, and and I think it's it's not one has precedent precedence over the other. Maybe it's the question of the chicken and the egg here, and that uh -huh. these ethics and this epistemological thing you can't just separate and which is first or which comes first and which comes second. So. But but yeah, I, I think you you can't ha you can't just clearly separate them. But anyway, let, let's talk about your book and and not what <laughs> I read in your book. So I, I I have to say that I was very pleased on on how you treated Derrida, and and especially the deconstructive operation. Like you already mentioned, you disagree here in this reading with some of the more known interpreters of of uh, of Derrida, Marion Caputo, uh, Haglund. Who, by the way, his uh, latest book, This Life, was, I believe, an absolute abomination. But you don't mention that in your book also because that wasn't possible because your book was published before uh, Haglund's book. But anyway, you accused them of always coming short in their interpretation and of Derrida and of the deconstruction. And, and, and I completely agree here with you. And I think that your reading of Dionysius and your bringing him into this discussion is of great help in making that clear to the readers as well. So... Could you maybe say a little bit more about this uh, taking deconstruction further than his critics have done up until today? Sure. I mean, I have a lot to say about this, and one of the one of the main <laughs> things. Have time. I, okay, great. <laughs> one of the main things I want this book to do is to sort of rescue Derrida from his interpreters. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like in my in, yeah, sure, <laughs> uh, someone needed to do it. I feel like yeah, in, exactly. <laughs> Uh, in my field of religious studies and theology, uh, I think Der Derrida was ruined for a, a generation of interpreters by this sort of dominant reading that developed. Um, partly because, I mean, I have a lot of personal appreciation for Jack Caputo. I think he um, like, is a good man. His work was very helpful for me, in fact, and helped to help me to come to grips with Derrida. And Caputo's work is clear and clarifying and 
displays the theological sensibility that I have a lot of uh, sympathy with. But at the same time, I think he overemphasized the indeterminacy of, of, mm. of Derrida's work in general, and in particular, his attitude towards religion. Mm. And a lot of it hinges on his reading of negative theology. So um, I feel like a lot of scholars of religion and theology came, came developed the impression that Derrida insists on a religion without religion that doesn't have any determinate content, um, partly because Caputo convinced them that Derrida thought that negative theology was the sort of most the most negative that theology could be but it still wasn't negative enough because it still continued to make affirmations about a sort of god beyond being and um and so one of the things i'm trying to do is to is to show that that was that was always a misreading of derrida's project that actually i think over and against caputo's reading as i've said Derrida doesn't reject negative theology in that way. Mm-hmm. And in fact, his thought structurally makes the same gesture that Dionysius does, which is to say Derrida insists upon a really rigorous uncertainty, but he exemplifies an affirmation that persists in the face of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And that affirmation isn't simply indeterminate. It's not a sort of um, sort of vague stretching forth, um, but it's it's the affirmation of particular things. So in Derrida, in Dionysius, the affirmation is quite clearly of the liturgy of the Christian church and the Eucharist and the hierarchy of the church. Um, those are things that the, those are things that in detail Derrida doesn't affirm. So Dionysius and Derrida affirm hopes that have different content in my reading. Mm-hmm. But Derrida also affirms a lot of things that are determinate in just the same way. So uh, Derrida's affirmation of democracy, he sort of emphasizes that democracy um, has a kind of uh, it's elusive in a way that uh, Dionysius thinks the divine is elusive. Derrida says it can't be sort of grasped or instantiated or even conceptualized with certainty. But at the same time, Derrida acknowledges that the concept of democracy that he operates with has a history. It's particular. It's not simply a sort of indeterminate affirmation, but it is formed by a certain sort of European history of reflection on politics. And what's more, Derrida sometimes, not often, but sometimes says that he thinks the best way to achieve this democracy to come that he describes is to affirm particular political structures. So he sometimes talks about sort of socialist politics in France. Sometimes he talks about the UN Security Council and its importance, which is just to say Derrida recognizes that even if democracy is something that we can't ever totally uh, understand, it's elusive in some radical sense. At the same time, he, he thinks that we have to, if we're going to participate in politics, we have to say certain things seem like they're the best thing to do if we're going to, if we're going to pursue democracy. All that is to say, I think pretty clearly in Derrida, um, he's doing something that's deeply different from what Caputo describes. At the same time, in addition to sort of trying to push back against Caputo's reading, I try to push back against two other interpreters that you've mentioned. So Jean-Luc Marion and Martin Haglund. Mm-hmm. And in my reading, Caputo, Marion, Haglund represent sort of three dominant readings of Derrida that also correspond actually to three important responses to the sort of problem of religion in that secular age, which is to say some people they recognize religion as a problem in, in, in this context that we live in. And so they retreat to a sort of indeterminate spirituality like Caputo, or they sort of assert a dogmatic confidence, which sometimes Marion slips in in my reading. Or they say that, um, you know, people have to adopt a kind of radical atheism that rejects religion as such. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I try to do with this reading of Derrida and Dionysius is to show that they represent a third alternative. And um, and in fact, Dionysius, I think, uh, shows that the sort of dogmatic confidence that Marion describes, the sort of the, the way in which Marion affirms the liturgy of the church, mm-hmm is quite different from, from Dionysius' affirmation of these things. And then with Haglund, Haglund, I think you're right. I mean, his radical atheism is uh, is antithetical to the deepest instincts of Derrida's project. He gets Derrida, I think almost, I think he's, it's a very brilliant reading of Derrida. It's very forceful. But I think he he gets Derrida exactly wrong, precisely as <laughs> far as his, his, his reading of Derrida makes Derrida sort of univocal where I see Derrida as being attentive to um, to polyphony all of the time. He, mm. um, he sort of makes Derrida into into Richard Dawkins, 
Mm. But mm. Derrida is a much more sophisticated and nuanced reader of, of religious traditions. And his reading of negative theology exemplifies this. He, mm. he recognizes that in negative theology, like in every text that he reads, there's always more than one voice. There's always more than one thing going on. So one of the things I want to do in pushing back against these readings is to show that, first, these, these texts have a lot more to offer than most readers have acknowledged. So it's worth going back to them. Because, second, they help us to think about a sort of a, a, an alternative, a fourth alternative approach to the problem of religion in the secular age. It's not simply indeterminacy. It's not dogma. It's not radical atheism. But it's, it's uh, a hope that, in my reading, people who are religious and people who aren't, in fact, share it. You you just mentioned, and we already mentioned it a couple of times, the term secular age, and also the title of your book is Hope in a Secular Age. Now, we've had, had, we've had so many different takes and interpretations on the secular. Just to think about one of the other authors you mentioned in your book is Charles Taylor's take, or then already the, the, the mentioned Martin Haglund, who has the extreme and the radical take on, on secularization. But we can also think about Carl Schmidt. Or then Jürgen Habermas is both secularism. So there are so many different theories of the secular age. So where would you situate yourself in this enormous spectrum? Yeah. So this the secular age is sort of a it's the provides the context for my account of hope. Mm. One of the things I want to do is to push back on some Christian theologians who act as if nothing happened. So there's a certain theological perspective that simply wants to sort of go back to the good old days of the Middle Ages mm -hmm. when um, Christianity controlled the power of the state and everyone was Christian uh, because they sort of had to be. And I, I find that vision to be dystopian, but I, I also think it's unrealistic because the thinkers that you've described, and in particular Charles Taylor, I sort of discussed briefly at the outset of my book, I think they argue convincingly that something changed in, in Western modernity. And, and so, um, yeah, we, we, I think if we're going to think about what religion means now, we have to do so in the context of secularity and even atheism and take them, and take them seriously as, as realities that are here. One of the things, as I mentioned at the outset, this has helped me to do is to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, think about what hope means, because there's a certain, a uh, certain vision of Christian hope that, that acts as if it provides a sort of certainty that the secular hope can't offer. And I, I think this is a mistake. I think that um, not only not only does it not, I think it's a mistake because we can see that it doesn't work now because people who are religious now realize that it's not obvious in the way that they, that people might have thought in the 14th century. But secondly, I think this this shows us that religious hope was never uh, obvious in exactly that way. It was. It was. It always had this uh, persistence in the face of uncertainty built within it. Um, mm. And so, in that sense, I think secularity is an opportunity to clarify, to sort of go back to negative theology and traditions of that kind to clarify what uh, what religious faith always was. I also think, and this is the focus of the last two chapters of my book. I think that. Theorists like Carl Schmitt that you've alluded to underline the way in which uh, religion and politics were always sort of intertwined, that politics and theology aren't separate discourses, but they actually affect each other in really deep ways. So the sort of main thing I want to contribute to this debate over secularity is, is to try to think about that nexus between politics and theology and using hope as a sort of hinge between them. Because one of the things that's interesting about hope is that it's, it has this theological history that's quite ancient, but it's also really important for politics. I'm especially mm -hmm. sensitive to this as an American because it's it's been a really deep theme in American political discourse. Mm -hmm. But around the world, politicians often appeal to hope implicitly or explicitly. And so I want to think about what, what work is hope doing there and what can the sort of um, political theological character of hope tell us about um, first, what what role religious communities might have in secular societies, and then second, um, what uh, how is our politics actually working in theological ways that we should be sensitive to? Um, I, I, if if I may quickly interrupt you here, I, I thought that 
one statement you made about hope, and I think this this fits nicely here. You said that hope is a practice, and I thought that I think this fits perfectly well in how Schmidt would understand his political theology, because because it's 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 an action. It's not just waiting. It, it, it's something really practical, a practice, something that needs to be done. Am I reading too much in this? No, no, not at all. No, you're right. I mean, this is this is the central theme of my of my book is to construe hope as a as an ethical practice, as a discipline, mm. Um, mm. rather than a sort of a wish or emotion. So some philosophers treat hope as if it's a feeling. Some philosophers argue, many philosophers argue that hope is dependent upon knowledge in some way that mm. one can only hope for what one knows to be possible or believes to be possible. I think that those sorts of hopes aren't aren't robust enough to do the work that we mm. need hope politically. No. Exactly. And, and hope as, as, as some rational decision or as an emotional decision, I don't think it has the, the capacity to make a political change. That's and right. We are seeing this now. If, if all these emotionality in politics and, 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 and in decision making involved, there are no decisions being made anymore because everybody's so emotional. I think that's the same with hope. No, I agree completely. Now, one last question, and then this exam will finally be over. And let us talk a little bit more about hope. We already mentioned it, but your understanding of hope is just not, or, or this is quite tricky maybe here, is it's not the traditional religious one. So do tell us a little bit more about your understanding of this always rather tricky concept. So I think that you're right, that my understanding of hope is pushing back against some dominant religious interpretations of hope. And so there are, um, I've, I've mentioned some Christian theologians argue that Christian hope is a sort of certainty. And there are some themes in Christian scripture that might imply that and certain trends in medieval and modern theology that would lead people to think that Christian hope uh, provides a sort of a sort of security or safety that other people mm. can't access. I actually, I'm trying, one of the things I'm trying to do here is to retrieve a sort of another tradition that I think is also quite traditional. So in my book, I discuss, for instance, um, the Apostle Paul, who in the book of Romans in the New Testament, um, associates hope with invisibility. So he says that uh, hope that is seen is not hope. And it's in this context that he says that uh, that creation groans for um, for the uh, the sort of fulfillment of the of the promises of of God and Jesus. So I feel like th this is a tradition that for Dionysius is really important. So Dionysius uh, is, a, is a pseudonym adopted by by this early Christian author. Um, and he takes it from a, a convert of the Apostle Paul, who's described in the book of Acts. So Dionysius is writing four or five centuries after the fact. Mm -hmm. But he sort of situates himself as a follower of Paul. And the sort of Pauline impetus is really deep in his negative theology. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the themes that's here is this theme that um, that there's a sense in which now even even christians who affirm as dionysius does the sort of traditional claims of christian theology is a sense in which they remain in suspension that the promises aren't fulfilled and so there's this need for a persistence uh, in the state of unfulfillment and in my understanding dionysius exemplifies uh the discipline of hope that persists in the in the face of this sort of uh, uncertainty and unfulfillment when things aren't seen when things aren't certain and that, as I've suggested briefly before in our conversation, I think that's a, that's the thing that he shares on, a, on the deepest level with mm. Derrida, this mm. commitment to a persistence that um, that acknowledges that things are uncertain. It doesn't act as if things are more um, more secure than they actually are, but presses forward nonetheless. Mm. So for me, in my mind, this is this is how I interpret that. I sort of go back to these political theological questions that I was mentioning, I think this model is an approach to politics that offers an alternative between a sort of um, radical dogmatic secularism that would oppose religion as such, exclude religion from the public sphere. And on the other hand, a sort of theocracy that would try to reinstitute some some sort of, um, you know, religious control uh, of, of political power. I think the hope that I have in mind um, models what I call a negative political theology that that shows that theological traditions can make a positive contribution to politics mm. without 
without claiming control over the mm. over the public sphere. Precisely through this understanding of hope, is something that is persistent but uncertain. Mm. Well, thank you so much, David, for this very enlightening conversation. And maybe one final quick question, especially important, I think, considering your understanding of hope as perseverance in insecurity. Can we have hope, not in our secular, but in our COVID age? I, I certainly hope so. I mean, <laughs> I think that, I think that the, we need the sort of hope that I have in mind now. And I've been thinking a lot about what what the time that we're living in has to teach me about hope, because mm. the the changes that we're that we we see in our societies are really momentous, and I feel like we're still not sure what they'll mean. But I think in the meantime, one of the things that's really dangerous is that the sort of the the two dangers that I mentioned at the outset are threatening now: complacency and despair. It's tempting mm. a lot of political leaders act as if COVID is just going to disappear. Um, mm. Or on the other hand, they they say there's nothing we can do, and so you know we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't even try. And mm. I think the sort of hope that I've tried to describe offers an alternative. And I think that's that's what we need to do is to acknowledge that there's a lot that we don't know about the about the crises that we're living through, both both in terms of public health, but also in terms of politics and public life. Mm. Um, we don't know how things are going to work out. Things might get worse before they get better. Mm. But we need to do the best that we can, given given what we do know. And in order to in order to press forward while while acknowledging that uncertainty, I think we need hope. I think hope offers this sort of negative political theology that um, is uh, open and flexible to to learning as as things change, but also. Um, that uh, sustains this affirmation and action in the face of really difficult circumstances. Yeah, I agree. So thanks again for being with us, David. It's been a real pleasure. There is still very much to say about your book. And so for all those who want to have a closer look at David's book, it's called Hope in a Secular Age, Deconstruction, Negative Theology and Future of Faith. It is published by Cambridge University Press, and I sincerely recommend it also because it's very well written and short, and who doesn't like a short philosophy book once in a while? <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks, Christoph. Thank you. So thank you all for being with us in Bookaholics. My name is Christoph van Houten, and I hope you will tune in to one of our future features as well. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>